I am Dr. Nashley Cephas, and I am founder and CEO of The Bean Path. I'm an expert in artificial intelligence, and I noticed, um, having been born and raised here in Jackson, Mississippi, that I still notice a lot of gaps as far as technology amongst our communities. I love being able to come back and show people, one, what is artificial intelligence, two, show them how they're kind of already using it, whether they know it or not, and three, showing them all the benefits of it, as well as things to be concerned about. Today is one of our tech office hours that we have usually every second Saturday at a local library in Jackson, Mississippi. So the tech office hours are completely free. We've been able to offer those coding classes where some youth come in to learn how to make beats, for instance, or older individuals who are wanting to do something different, they had the opportunity to learn how to create a website. Today we'll be learning how to use uh, video editing software with AI, uh, taught by Dr. Nashley Cephas. And basically this is gonna take a very intimidating uh, tasks such as video editing and make it a lot easier and more accessible for everyone. The Bean Path has really impacted our local community and that we can take in people who sign up for our office hours, show them how to use their technology in a way that's more efficient to them. Um, sometimes they feel intimidated and we show them that it's very easy to use everything and we're here to show them how. I've been coming to the Bean Path since I've attended the Coding Academy when Nashley Cephas first came around. <laughs> to be honest, this is very inspiring. That I look up to her a lot. So to see her out here, and uh, especially down the street from where I live, to be at the library and teaching this type of technology and stuff, especially when I grew up around technology, is, is very exciting. Uh, Dr. Nashley Cephas has worked tirelessly to expand the reach of technology in Mississippi, and this has directly impacted the people who live here, the economy. It has encouraged others to get involved in the tech community and to otherwise seek tech careers when they may have not thought that they could do it before. We've hosted coding classes and also have done one-on-one -on -one teaching individuals who aren't in school, who haven't been in school in a while, those specific skills. I hope that people come to the Bean Path Tech Office Hours and walk away with a newfound love or passion for technology and knowing how they can use it in their everyday lives, basically to make their lives a lot easier. I am Dr. Nashley Holly Cephas, CEO and founder of The Bean Path. Last year we helped over 250 people, gave away over $8,000 in grants and scholarships, and we'd love to help you cultivate to sprout so you can determine your route. It doesn't matter what field you're in. It can be nursing. It can be you can be a writer. You can be, uh, you know, into sports. But everybody pretty much needs technology in today's world in order to not be left behind. In order to really move forward. Bean Path is a nonprofit 501c3 organization where we essentially do free tech help for anyone. Um, we're originally starting with setting up tech office hours in the local libraries. Uh, we're based here in Jackson, Mississippi, and we would like to empower people with technology. You're on. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining in today. Um, this is the Bean Path Tech Office Hours, uh, our first well, it's our second virtual office hours. Uh, we did our first one last month, uh, and of course we all know why, and which is very fitting for why we have our special guest today. And we're gonna talk about different things from mental health and how technology has affected uh, people's lives, especially in terms of telemedicine. And we're excited to just see, you know, the inside of these, these frontline essential workers um, that are working for us every day, and we really appreciate that. Uh, in case you all don't know, the Bean Path is a 501c3 nonprofit based in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I'm actually sitting in at my home in Atlanta, Georgia, right now. Uh, majority of our panelists are in Mississippi, and so we're still able to connect and, uh, and keep this thing rolling. As my my grandma says, "One monkey don't stop no show," so we got to keep going. And so uh, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, we have a few people. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the bios of our, our special guests today. And we're going to start with Kimberly Mason-Peoples. Uh, so Kimberly Mason-Peoples 
is a staff counselor and doctoral student at Mississippi State University. Go Bulldogs. Uh, additionally, she is the owner of Phoenix Consulting Wellness LLC, which is a private practice that provides counseling and clinical supervisory services. And she is a licensed professional counselor, that supervisor for Mississippi, a national certified counselor, an approved clinical supervisor, and a board certified telemental health provider. As a counselor and a trainer, Miss Peoples works with many helping professionals and takes pride in her work with lay people. Mrs. Peoples research focuses on minority mental health, specifically black slash African-American slash people of African descent, because there's a difference. Mm -hmm. I know that too, we can talk about that. And women with these ethnic, ethnic racial identities. Uh, additionally, she focuses on counselor competence, clinical supervision, juvenile justice and perinatal mental health. And so I need to ask her what that is because I don't know, but we'll get to that. Uh, Ms. Peoples' background includes working in acute treatment, collegiate counseling, and clinical supervision. Her passion is working with supervisors of traumatic experiences. As response to this work, she is trained in eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. Ooh, that's a lot. Additionally, Ms. Peoples is trained in perinatal mental health and pursuing credentialing in this area as well. This pursuit is due to the experiences of black mothers being ignored and minimized during childbirth. Uh, presenting on various mental health related topics, Ms. Peoples provides workshops and outreach nationally and internationally. Additionally, she is the 2016 National Board of Certified Counselors Foundation Minority Fellow. Personally, she is a mother of a son, Aubrey, and a daughter, Journey, in addition to being a wife, Jamal, and a uh, wife to Jamal and a daughter. Um, hey, Kim, how's it going? It's good. Thanks, Nashley. Yeah, so thanks for joining. And for y'all who don't know, uh, Kim and I actually went to uh, we went to high school together at Tower APEC, um, and, and we played the piano. I think was it was it middle school or high school? Yes. Peoples or, or Murray? Middle school. Middle school. Peoples. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, peoples. It was at Peoples. Yeah. So, she, uh, you know, we, we played, played a little piano there. And I'm um, just telling <laughs> really quickly, um, Kimberly, what, what is perinatal? What does that mean? So, perinatal is the um, experiences of women uh, during pregnancy and even after pregnancy. So, this term uh, is kind of used interchangeably when you hear folks say postpartum, that's more recognizable. But perinatal examines and explores. Um, the mental disorders that happen uh, because of childbirth, um, whether it's during, um, after, and even before in the preparation phase. Got you. Wonderful. That's that's interesting. And I learned something. You know, there's something new every day, they say. That's something new. All right. Wonderful. We're going to uh, move on to our next panelist. Um, we have Dr. Jasmine Hollinger. She's a dermatologist. And uh, Dr. Uh, Jasmine also went to uh, school with me. We went to Murray High School together. Uh, graduated class of 03. Go Mustangs. Mustangs. <laughs> So uh, Dr. Hollinger is one of the only African-American dermatologists in Mississippi. She now practices at Robert C. Klingen Dermatology in Vicksburg, where she is the only dermatologist in Vicksburg slash Warren County. Also, Dr. Hollinger practiced at University Physicians at Grants Ferry in Flowood. Besides treating issues such as vitiligo, which is a loss of pigmentation and patches of skin, uh, melasma, brown patches usually in the face, and hyperpigmentation. Uh, she also treats acne, skin cancer, and hair loss. Thank you for defining those things in the bio for me. Uh, she uh, saw dermatology as a way to give back to her community, but she also saw a lack of access to care for patients of color as her brother had to go to Washington, D.C. for his vitiligo treatment. Um, and it's all the way from Jackson, Mississippi. So that's, that's quite a, a ways to travel. Um, Hollinger attended Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, good barbecue up there, uh, where she graduated with a bachelor's degree in African and American, uh, African and African American studies with a minor in biology in 2007. She then attended UMMC School of Medicine, where she received her medical degree in 2011. 
She then did a year long internal medicine internship at the hospital. After that, she did her dermatology residency at Howard University, HU, I know some, some folks out there, in Washington, D.C., which she completed in 2015. Dr. Hodger is in solo practice, private practice in Vicksburg, and serves as the only dermatologist in Vicksburg, as we mentioned. She is also an American Council on Exercise, certified group fitness instructor. Isn't that amazing? Uh, she has been married for seven years to her husband, Lowell, who is an associate director of band and music professor at Jackson State University. Go Tigers. <laughs> they have one daughter, Kenzie, and a miniature schnauzer named Kingsley. And I have I have a, a Yorkie, so I know how those little dogs can be. Yes. So, hey, Jasmine, how's it going? It's going good. Thank you for having me, Nashley. Wonderful. So, so Jasmine, explain to us why why you're sitting in your car right now, real briefly. <laughs> because my three year old won't let me be great. Because my name gets called about ten times a day, more than that. That's an under uh, estimate. But because um, you know, it's nothing like being a mom. And as we're coming up on Mother's Day, my husband can be at home. She doesn't utter his name. But if I'm in the house, mom, mom. Mama, ma and then won't anything, so I had to come hide. <laughs> yep. So I, I don't have children myself, but I have a dog, and he, he gives me the blues. But I know we have two other mothers on the panel here, including yeah. Kim, and our next one I'm going to read, Ebony. And so I'm sure a lot of people out there can relate. And however you got to get it done, and just do whatever you need to do. I, I totally yep. get it. <laughs> All right, so our next panelist, uh, Miss Ebony Du Bois Moore. Uh, so Ebony is a native of Moss Point, Mississippi. That's down there on the coast, for those of y'all who don't know, the uh, little Gulf Coast. Uh, but she resides in Jackson, Mississippi. She is a graduate of Moss Point High School, Tougaloo College, and Jackson State University. Upon earning a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from Tougaloo College and a Master of Science in Guidance and Counseling from Jackson State University, she has worked in various mental health settings, some of those settings range from inpatient treatment, community mental health, and nonprofit social services. Ebony has over 19 years of experience working with various populations who present mental health challenges. Some of those uh, populations served include, but are not limited to, adults and unaccompanied minors. Uh, she possesses the following licensures or certifications, licensed professional counseling, uh, counselor, licensed clinical mental health therapist, and national certified counselor. She is dedicated to helping individuals find internal peace while navigating through life challenges. Oh, I feel you. All right. <laughs> Ebony has found that everyone needs a safe place to clear their mental clutter without judgment. In 2010, she began her entrepreneurship by becoming a licensed, listen to this, nail technician and established Nails by Dawn LLC. Now the purpose was to intermesh healthy nail care, and I'm not gonna show my nails right now, <laughs> and, and counseling. Isn't that something? She believes that creating a relaxing, stress-free environment where individuals can be pampered and allowed to vent is essential to one's mental health and growth. Okay, snaps, snaps, snaps. All right, in 2017, she established Ebony, the Voice More LPC NCC LLC, a private practice that provides consultation and assessment services to immigrants seeking lawful status in the United States. And I know we have a lot of uh, youth and students um, that are you know, very concerned about that. So that's great work that you're doing there, Ebony. And our last panelist, I believe he is joined now. So uh, Dr. Justin, are you there? Can you hear us? I had to unmute myself. Yes, I'm here and accounted for us. Wonderful. Great, great. Thank you so much. Oh, Ebony, I'm at, I'm sorry, I didn't ask you how you're doing. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining. We appreciate you for joining. And I'm, I'm excited to get into these topics. So our last uh, bio I'm going to read is for Dr. Justin Turner. And thank you so much. He's in internal medicine. Uh, Dr. Turner's approach to medicine involves treating the whole person. He feels health can only be optimized if we understand physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health 
are interrelated and not separate entities. This philosophy combined with compassion, excellent bedside manner, dedication to service, provides an effective, comprehensive model. Dr. Turner spent time in Jefferson Claiborne, please say the Jefferson Claiborne, and Warren County School District, where he finished at Warren Central High School. He graduated from Jackson State University, oh, the Tigers in the house, with a major in chemistry and minor in biology. Dr. Turner then completed medical school at Meharry Medical College, go Meharry. Given his commitment to service, Dr. Turner chose University of Mississippi Medical Center to come back home to complete his residency. I love that. Dr. Turner has been recognized for several awards, and I'm going to read these awards. This is a long list. So I'm trying to get through this. 2015 Top 50 Under 40 Business Persons in Mississippi by Mississippi Business Journal. 2014 Mississippi Healthcare Hero by Mississippi Business Journal. 2015 and 2014 finalists, Best Doctor of Jackson by Jackson Free Press. 2014 Image Award, Mu Sigma Theta Chapter of Phi Beta Sigma. The 2013 Young Merit Award by MMSA, one of the 2013 Young Influentials of Jackson by Boom Jackson, and 2012 Newcomer Physician of the Year, amongst other awards. Okay, Ooh, what the, how many other ones? I wonder. But anyway, he has participated in several community service activities, including serving as medical expert on WLBT, and 105.9 Talking Sports Live with Deuce McAllister and Rob J. Board certified in, in internal medicine. Uh, Dr. Turner, he, he notes he is currently taking new patients. I want to make sure y'all know that. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Turner, for joining. How's it, how's it going today? Going good. Just on parent life today and uh, trying to get Mother's Day things together, too. So I appreciate you all having this and allowing me to participate. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much again. Like I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. So I want to just kind of let's just kind of first of all, uh, you know, for those you don't know me, I'm Dr. Nashley Cephas. Uh, I am uh, an a, a applied scientist at Amazon. I, I'm the founder of Green Path, born and raised in Jackson. Uh, so I went to Mississippi State and Georgia Tech in both computer engineering, uh, and I got my PhD from Georgia Tech. And I, I started the Bean Path because. I just noticed a gap in the technology between the worlds that I was seeing out on the West Coast and in Atlanta and in New York. And then when I would come back home, it was just such a different picture of what people were exposed to and, and the opportunities that they were afforded. And so I, I really appreciate you all for being here today. We want to talk about um, technology and medicine and mental health. But just on the on the surface, I think uh, why I did want to do this, I just want to if we can spend some time and just have a quick moment of silence of you all know that the young man, um, Ahmad Aubrey, uh, who was uh, killed in Georgia and has been affecting a lot of people across the country right now. And we could just spend just a quick uh, moment of silence for him. All right, thank you so much. All right, so as we move on, I want to touch base with each of you. And uh, Dr. Turner, since we got you up here on the screen, uh, I just want to ask all of you, how has your day-to-day -day work uh, changed since COVID has hit? Yeah, I think that um, things have totally turned healthcare upside down. Um, we're at a time where uh, in Mississippi, we're kind of behind the curve. You know, we kind of saw the... Uh, spikes in California. We saw uh, what's been going on in New York and continues to go on. And um, although we try to be as prepared as possible here in Mississippi, uh, we still realize that no matter what we uh, attempted to do, we still are approaching rising numbers uh, to this day. So as it relates to healthcare, uh, we have not been able to see patients in our office in the same way that we were before. Uh, surgeries, procedures, uh, things that dermatologists do as well as other uh, types of procedures have been canceled. We pretty much tried to empty the hospitals as much as possible just to prepare for the possible surge. When we had Hurricane Katrina, we kind of had this response where we made sure that we did not overwhelm the medical capacity. So when you hear things like flattening the curve and um, 
those type of uh, models we put now stay home shelter in place. The goal is not necessarily to reduce the total amount of COVID cases. It's not to overwhelm the system all at one time. So trying to uh, prepare for that has been challenging. I'm actually on, I think like five task force right now. One that reports to the governor, one with Mayor Lamont and Senator Jackson. And we're meeting, man, four or five times a week. In addition to our day-to-day -day routine, which is already pretty demanding as far as a six to eight hour work week. Um, so it's been it's been challenging making the adjustments. Uh, we have issues with insurance companies allowing us to uh, utilize technology to try to take care of patients. In Mississippi, sometimes we appear to be behind compared to other states. But nonetheless, uh, we're taking it one day at a time because we're getting new information. It appears one day at a time. So just trying to uh, keep up with the change, being adaptable, and being prepared to um, being prepared for un the unexpected. Uh, but doing everything we can to control the factors that we can. So it's taking one day at a time. Got you. And and just to, so everybody can know, your day-to-day -day involves what exactly? Just as so, far as being so, in the, yeah. Yeah, so are, are we talking since COVID-19 has started or before? Uh, uh, I guess before, just in general, what is the so day? In general, like right, so, so, I, so I'm a private, um, I'm in private practice as well. And I own my own internal medicine practice. So I pretty much take care of adults all day, which is pretty much eight to five. I'm also the medical director of a hospice agency. So I'm communicating with my nurses and meeting with them every other week. I'm also um, a doctor over at Select Specialty Rehab Hospital. So patients that lead a hospital, but they're not, they're, they're stable enough to lead a hospital, but too sick to be at home. Um, they go to places like, uh, select specialty rehab or long-term acute care facilities. Uh, I work there as well, so I do that like four nights a month. So it's like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Yeah. Um, and then after hours, we're uh, responding to labs, looking at you guys' x-ray reports. And and another part that you all don't see, we're fighting with the insurance to get them to approve procedures and approve for you all to get the CTs and, and different things like that. So that's kind of day-to-day. Post-COVID-19, most of that still happens where we're doing telehealth visits. So the same way that we're communicating, we're doing the same with our patients. And there are some challenges, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that, and that's maybe the purpose of the beam path, because in Mississippi, like I said, we're kind of behind as it relates to technology. So trying to interface technology with medicine has been a challenge. But yeah, so now telehealth visits all day and Zoom meetings all yep. day. Yep. Uh, the mayor called an emergency uh, Zoom meeting yesterday at 3 o'clock as we prepare to give the most current notice as it relates to businesses and different things like that. So that's kind of day-to-day -day, uh, right now. Got you. Yeah, no, I, I definitely uh, understand it. And a lot of people don't, they're not aware of all these little things that, you know, people in this field go through. And so thank you for uh, line, laying that out for us. Uh, now I'm going to jump to uh, Kimberly. Uh, Kim, so maybe you can tell us um, how maybe your day-to-day uh, -day has changed since COVID. So maybe what it was like before and what it's like after. So one of the biggest changes is before we were seeing college students around, you know, eight to five. Um, and then we had on call after hours and on the weekend. That changed, of course, right at spring break. Um, at spring break, we started to see numbers increase in Mississippi. University IHL was like, okay, we got to address it. Um, and of course, it was in different areas of Mississippi where the numbers were higher, where there were universities um, and colleges. And so you had, I think, a discrepancy between what decisions were going to be made, and they wanted it to be a united front. And so ultimately, we had an extended spring break which that was the time for my um, office to try to prepare for distance counseling or what we refer to as telemental health counseling. Um, the BCTMH credential, as you said earlier in my bio, um, allows me to provide that service. So while I had experience providing that service, not everybody in the state has that credential. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. if you look at our licensure um, numbers, uh, I wouldn't even say half of our clinicians have a BCTMH credential. Um, and that goes back to what Dr. Turner was saying, you know, telemental health, that's a hard sell sometimes because one of the biggest things about counseling is able to, the ability to be across from your client, face-to-face -face contact um, so that they can feel empowered. And so sometimes that screen is a barrier. 
uh, especially with things going around in your environment. But right now, that's all we got. So um, we did the extended spring break, which gave time for my colleagues to get some training, some knowledge um, on telemental health. It gave time for me even to just extend that knowledge because uh, I just believe in being well versed and things do change day to day, especially with this. So one of the things the licensure board did in Mississippi uh, for LPCs is they gave a waiver. The governor approved that so that we could provide telemental health without the credential. Um, and so you have a lot of now, because of course, if you have a private practice, that's all you can do um, is tell them on the health. And if that's your income, aside from not wanting to abandon patients due to ethical guidelines, um, you need that service. You need the ability to do that. Um, and we know credentials can cost a lot of money. So um, once the extended spring break was over, that next week we did start seeing clients distantly, um, by distance. Um, and of course, for a lot of college students, even though people assume college students want to do stuff across the screen, we found that, nope, not really. <laughs> um, they were glad to get that extended spring break, I think. Uh, some, of course, were distressed as a result. Um, but I think what has happened is they went home. Some went home with families. Majority of them did. And so they felt that support. So we hadn't been relied on as much as we were when we were physically there. But we expect those numbers to increase. So the biggest thing that happened for us was definitely that transition. And it was an abrupt transition. It wasn't uh, something that was over time. Yeah. And when you say telemental, yes. uh, you can quick, quickly define what that means exactly. Okay. So um, initially the credential was called a distance counseling credential. That's what we started with. Um, and that was just doing counseling across the screen. Um, and so mainly that's the main uh, arena that we use. We have to use a HIPAA compliant guideline, which I'm sure Dr. Turner knows all about that. Um, and so uh, they switched it to telemental health in an effort to align with telehealth. So in Dr. Turner's world, they say telehealth. And so telemental health came about in an effort to be aligned and not necessarily equal, obviously, but um, just so that those services for insurance purposes could get funded. Got you. Okay. Well, yeah, now I can imagine some students, you know, going through that, especially with such an abrupt change and trying yes. to adapt to it. A lot of people are probably in that same boat, unfortunately. Uh, we'll switch over now to uh, Dr. Dr. Hollinger. Uh, so, so definitely uh, want to know from you, uh, and, and you're kind of in, in transition and got your hands in a lot of different things. So, so let us know uh, how things have changed for you before and after uh, COVID. Um, so before, um, I was, well, I was at UMC mm -hmm. and, um, so I was, you know, in an academic setting, which is, um, different than, you know, being in private practice, but it was a pretty, uh, you know, seeing patients, um, I was seeing patients Monday through Thursday. And actually at the time I was the, um, lead physician of, uh, teledermatology. So I was kind of in a unique position when this, um, happened and um, we did primarily what's called storing forward, which is where we looked at photographs. So outside physicians or um, primary care providers, along with those at UMC, would send us um, send consults, and it would be a photograph, and it would just be a way to kind of triage patients to say, "Hey, this patient um, needs to be seen." In, in, you know, a dermatologist's office or it's something that their primary care provider can take care of um, or it's something that's not concerning and the need, to, you know, to have anything done to it. So that's what I was primarily um, doing, you know, more immediately prior to um, COVID-19. And then um, right before COVID-19 hit, I was in the uh, position of transitioning to private practice. Mm. Um, and so I was taken over from a retiring physician, a dermatologist, and, um, you know, with the intent to one day own the practice. And then COVID-19 hit. <laughs> so it kind of put everything um, kind of at a stalemate, so to speak, um, because the clinic already had been, you know, not really fully functioning because he had a lot of health issues. So, um, so, you know, basically I kind of walked into it already being a little slower and then COVID-19. So then it kind of went a lot slower. Um, and so basically, primarily what I do is I do see some patients in person. Um, you know, we have protocols and procedures to kind of streamline those patients. But of course, sometimes, you know, every, every issue to anybody is 
urgent, you know, mm -hmm. to me, an urgent might be a zit on my nose to the next person. It might be my hair is falling out. So that's such a subjective term. And it's hard for people to kind of, you know, be understanding. I think as healthcare providers, like, yeah, we understand that's an issue, but it's not <laughs> something right. that you really need to put yourself at risk. So I think that's part of a huge um, issue with tele uh, with, um, you know, everything with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, the other kind of challenge um, I've met um, being in Vicksburg is just uh, the primary patients that um, that I see are elderly patients. So a lot of them don't are not necessarily tech savvy. And so they are like, well, I don't know how to do Zoom or I don't know how to do this. And because I use um, video, I use a HIPAA compliant platform. Um, and if that doesn't fail, I've even used FaceTime um, or Google Duo. But um, so it's, it can be really challenging for the elderly population because a lot of times they don't want to be bothered with technology. <laughs> and they're like, I did, I've never done this. I don't want to do this. I don't, I have a flip phone. So that can be, you know, that's been a challenge. Um, and then you just have some patients that are like, no, I don't want to do telehealth. I want to be seen. And so that's another dilemma. It's like, well, do you tell them no at the possibility that it could be something serious or, you know, so that's kind of been, um, I think, a huge challenge that I face. And then with me being the only dermatologist, the other thing is we don't want um, and it's a lot of talk amongst us board certified dermatologists is, you know, we're essential in the sense that we don't want patients with, say, an eczema flare or psoriasis flare going and burdening the emergency room or burdening their primary care doctors for issues that, you know, they're dealing with patients, you know, that have corona and other things. And we don't want to overburden their offices or the ER or overburden or potentially put them at unnecessary risk. And so that's what has been a big issue about, you know, dermatologists not being able to, because we're kind of unique and, and very specialized in a lot of things. And so um, that's kind of one of the other challenges is who to see and not to see and when yeah. should you see them and so and what can we manage you know via you know um tele telemedicine and what do i have to lay my eyeballs on if a person has a skin cancer well can we operate on them you know to somebody that's not necessarily life and death because they're not going to die tomorrow but in our opinion you know it is life or death you know so yeah. it could be life or death so um that's kind of what you know we're uh you know we've been facing i've been facing currently Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And I, I could see where, you know, technology can definitely help with some of those challenges. But then again, if people aren't used to technology, then you might mm -hmm. actually be hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And um, and last but not least, um, Ms. Ebony, the boys more, um, let us hear from you about how uh, your day to day and, and your things have changed before and after COVID. Well, um, prior to COVID and, and, and currently, I am a full-time employee of Catholic Charities, and I am a, the lead therapist and clinical coordinator to the Unaccompanied Refugee Minors Program. And so what we do, we provide therapeutic services to refugee um, youth that are in foster care. And so being that COVID-19 has happened, instead of uh, me providing face-to-face -face services, therapeutic services to these youth, now we're having to see them through um, mental health, telehealth platform. Um, for them, for the most part, they were they were pretty okay with adjusting to seeing, uh, provide, receiving services via telehealth. It was not a challenge challenge for them, um, and so it did take some adjusting on my end. Um, I consider myself to be pretty pretty savvy when it comes to electronics, but everything happened so quickly. Um, we were at work one day and then a couple of days later, it was like, okay, everybody's working remotely. So as a result, I'm working remotely at home where I'm also homeschooling. So <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things yep. have changed. Um, as I stated earlier, you know, you may be doing a session and you may see a hand wave telling your child to, to you know, to go by mommy's work and yet they don't understand that. Um, in addition to that, with me in private practice, doing immigration consultations and immigration assessment for um, immigrants who are trying to get legal status here in the United States, so that was a challenge because prior to COVID, I was actually meet, meeting with them face to face to do these assessments. Um, most of them are not English speaking um, individuals, therefore I had to have a translator to translate for them. Now we're having to move from 
I'm moving from providing those services face to face to seeing them across the screen, again, which is challenging. Um, as far as what Ms. Kimberly stated, you do have to, good thing is the state of Mississippi did waive um, us having to become a board certified um, telehealth provider. Um, but I do see changes coming in the future. So my plan is definitely to go ahead and pursue that credentialing, not for myself, but to be able to provide adequate services to, you know, to other individuals. And so again, with the immigrant population, it is challenging where you have to be able to have a translator to translate for you and you're going back and forth. Um, the, the platform that I use um, through my private practice is simple practice. They do require that you have an email set up. Some individuals are saying, hey, you, I, I don't wanna set up an email. I prefer um, you just send me a text message. So you have to try to coast them into going with the changes that are requirement to provide those services. So our whole entire world has been flipped upside down as a result of, of COVID-19. But as I tell people, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade and you have to go, you know, try to go with the punches. And so that's what we're doing. We're going with the punches and trying to make sure that we provide adequate services to the populations that we can provide services to. Got you. No, I totally understand. I love what you said about, you know, you just got to keep keep going sometimes. Hey, we're yeah, we're in a, pan a pandemic, but, you know, things still need to be done and you got to keep moving forward on your goals. Um, that's very encouraging. And uh, the same way with uh, with the bean path, right? we have our tech office hours. Usually we're doing them in person. Uh, we're either over at the Mega Everest Library or uh, sometimes we're at the. Uh, Hold on a second. Are we still? Okay. Yeah. I was making sure. Okay. So sometimes we're at the Mega Everest Library. Sometimes we're at the Clinton Library. Um, and then other times we are um, at the uh, Eudora Welty Library. And so we come across a lot of senior citizens that, you know, need help with technology. Uh, we come across a lot of youth that need help. Um, we do youth workshops and, uh, you know, again, uh, being in person really helps because it's they're already intimidated about technology, and so actually being there one on one to walk them through and say, "Hey, this is a safe space," um, it really helps. So we've had challenges transforming to the virtual format, um, and we're still getting people in, but we're also considering, you know, how do we still reach the senior citizen demographic as well as like the really young folks that we're we're wanting to make sure we don't forget about. So definitely a lot of challenges and things to keep in mind. Um, all right, so so we've kind of heard from everyone now. And I think uh, this, since this is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, the month of May, uh, we do kind of want to uh, get some input from you all about, uh, you know, particularly, and a lot of you focus on um, African-Americans and the black community, uh, particularly for that demographic, what are some of the mental health challenges that, that you've seen that are going on right now in terms of COVID or just in terms of what COVID has caused and the, and the repercussions from COVID? Um, Nashville, I would say uh, definitely for African-American communities, um, we're affected because uh, initially because we're a collectivistic culture of people. Um, so we unite, we get our energy from being amongst people from our people whoever that is you know uh, whether it's blood kin or just kinships we've created um and so we know with COVID there's some restrictions due to social distancing due to the CDC guidelines um and that has become a stressor um for us this separation that we have to create from our families definitely can um exceed and go into some mental health concerns. And so um, definitely in the African-American community, you start talking about mental health concerns. You start talking about how stress uh, inflates or continues to grow um, and it goes into anxiety and depressive like symptoms, but then you get into, so where do you go for help? And so there's this cultural mistrust that exists amongst the African-American community when it talks about mental health. People don't wanna be labeled crazy. Um, that's the term that I hear often around family members, even though this is my profession, um, family members joke with me or they say, you know, what does that mean if I have to come see a counselor? Um, and so our, in the African-American community, mental health services are available. Sometimes they're not, though. It just depends. But then there's this restriction mainly because of cultural mistrust. And then I'm sure um, Ebony can bag me up and tell more about what the other areas are that are affected. But cultural mistrust definitely is, I would say, the beginning piece 
Um, so even though access is a limit, you also have that cultural mistrust that even if I do have access, I'm not about to walk in um, and see a clinician to discuss my problem because my problem is not that big. Um, or, you know, I just pick up and go or do what I have to do to survive. But we know this COVID thing is not about to change. Um, Dr. Turner and Dr. Hollinger both have spoke to that. Um, and so we do have to adjust. Um, and for the African-American community, the adapting piece uh, when it comes to mental health is definitely a hard piece, I think. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Anything else? One thing I would like to add too, as far as the, you know, the, the cultural component is, Sometimes African African Americans feel as if though, hey, well, I don't, I just don't want people in my business. Um, especially with African American counselors. I mean, I have had individuals who have asked, you know, well, can you refer me to somebody else? Somebody else meaning a therapist that is not African American. They feel that other races may be able to not, I'm not gonna say provide better care, but keep their business to themselves. So we constantly have to educate and re-educate whether they're our clients or a family member or friend, a neighbor, a church member that, hey, we have ethical guidelines that we have to follow as well, which they said our conversation has to be kept confidential amongst us unless, hey, if you, if, unless you threaten to harm yourself or somebody else, we have to go through educating um, our community on ethical guidelines. And so sometimes they feel as if though, well, I, well, that's too much or okay, if you say so, or I'm just going to pray it away. You know, so culturally, we have to try to educate um, our fellow fellow brothers and sisters on mental health issues and, and what it takes and, you know, what it takes and what needs to happen so that you can receive those services. Sometimes they'll listen to or read, not saying that social media does not provide positive information because it does. I read some information that is shared amongst professionals that I'm like, hey, I want to you know, adapt that into my lifestyle. I, I really enjoy what I read, but sometimes they will, individuals will read or, or read um, posts on social media and they think it's the gospel. And so we have to constantly try to educate them like, no, well, it's not quite to that extent, but let me tell you the truth because I'm in this profession and you have to go from there. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely about that um, and the stigma and everything. Uh, I, I, I have myself have seen a therapist before. Sometimes you just need to talk to somebody, even if just being black in America, given everything that's going on, uh, even today still uh, and recently in the news. And I think, uh, you know, especially in terms of work related stress, even now, uh, I'm going to kind of transition over to uh, Dr. Hollinger and Dr. Turner. And um, so we talked about this question for you all. So we talked about ways that technology um, and I'm sure you all are probably being pulled in a lot of different directions, you know, even with your family life uh, and, and, you know, wanting to find out ways how to balance it all. So I'm curious if you found some successful ways to help balance as well as if you uh, have ideas for how technology could help some of these these issues that you're dealing with. Like technology you're not already working with, but it could possibly be uh, something that, that could help. So you said you wanted to talk about balance and how technology can help, like, I guess, with patient care or in what what regard? Just in helping your life be more balanced and dealing with the uh, all the, the things that you have to deal with now because of uh, okay. you know, COVID. And, and for example, I uh, my my uh, my aunt suggested that we all get on a Zoom for uh, my grandmother for Mother's Day tomorrow. And, uh, and I know I have a cousin, uh, my little cousin, her, her mother uh, is planning a, a birthday party, drive through birthday party, drive through, get some cake, wave, hopefully pet, uh, drop off your gift, you know, and then making sure that, uh, you know, they are still interacting and having these activities, um, you know, to help. Um, I think, you know, I bet, I'm, I'm big about perspective. That's something I've been working on in my own life. And um, I think, you know, perspective is, carries a lot of weight because, you know, you can look at COVID as, oh, God, it's the worst thing that's ever happened. Or you can look at it as, you know, it's bad, but what are the good things that come out of this? And what are the things that I can learn um, that I can grow as a person or my family can grow? Um, and so uh, for me in my own personal life, 
it's definitely, you know, made me slow down uh, because I am very type A. Uh, I am probably a stereotypical black mother, uh, wife. You know, we think we can do it all. We want to do it all. Nobody can do it better than us. Uh, sometimes we just don't know how to sit down, <laughs> you know. Um, and so um, it's definitely uh, forced me um, to sit down uh, and to, you know, just take a breath um, and just take deep breaths and take more time for myself and um, to try to incorporate things that I was like, oh, I need to start reading more. But, you know, COVID has been an opportunity where now I've been able to um, do a little bit more reading um, because as people say, you know, you make a pro you make things a priority that you want, that you like, that you really want. If it's important, you're going to do it. And so I think, um, you know, COVID is really uh, made, you know, business something that we, we can't really use anymore or have as a distraction in our lives. And so um, it's really helped me to sit down and, you know, reevaluate things. And, um, you know, for a lot, I've been seeing like on social media, a lot of people doing like drive by parades and you know we've been walking more in our neighborhood and having conversations with neighbors that I never would have talked to before um and just really feeling like having more of a sense of community um in my own neighborhood and even with you know my own family um talking to people more than what I probably would have done prior to COVID-19 um, and so um, I really see, you know, the benefit of it in, the, in it, as odd as it sounds, yeah. um, is that it really makes people slow down and look at the things that are important um, and what really matters, you know, to you most. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate. I, my daughter is three, so I don't have I don't have to like, you know, Ebony and me can't really have to do like homeschooling thank god um but it's really made me uh have to come up with creative ways to keep my daughter occupied do things and think outside of the box like i definitely don't have a green thumb i do not guard and i don't like planning but i was like you know that'll be a good thing you know to try to start doing with her and so you know we made us a little egg crate garden and you know things that i i probably wouldn't have done before and so um so yeah i think you know, that's really been a benefit. And I think technology um, has, you know, if I've been able to, like my grandma, she knows how to FaceTime. So I get to face, she learned how to FaceTime. So I get to FaceTime with her more. Uh, my other grandma, unfortunately, she's not, she's not quite there yet. Um, but I think it allows us to reach people that, you know, you may not be able to have been able to reach as much. Um, and, uh, you know, and, come up with more creative ways to stay connected with you know your loved ones and and uh for me I, I'm into fitness so um I was used to going to the gym and being diligent about going to the gym and so now I've kind of had to force myself even though sometimes I don't feel like it's like well you can't go to the gym that was kind of my escape but now I have to really make the effort to invest in that time for me to do workouts you know via if it's an Instagram video if it's you YouTube, if it's, you know, something online. So technology has really helped in the fitness world because, you know, it's like, well, you can't really have an excuse. You don't have to have a gym to work out. So, um, so it's from that perspective too, is, um, technology has helped from the fitness aspect. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and Dr. Turner, I, I'd like to hear your response. And just for those of you watching, uh, we are taking questions online, Facebook live, YouTube, as well as on our website. Uh, so feel free and, and we can ask questions there. We have about 10 minutes left, but um, Dr. Turner, so again, uh, you know, how are you balancing and, and any, any ways that technology can help with some of the issues? Well, I think, you know, I heard Bishop Morton say, you know, personality is your reputation, but uh, what you smell like is who you really are. And I think this time has really uh, forced us to really see the true depth of our character and who we are, as well as the people that are around us. And like Dr. Holly just said, uh, sometimes we can be uh, so busy that we have become habitual doers and not habitual thinkers. So I think it's forced a lot of us to actually use our God-given brain uh, to make sure that we're strategizing, we're analyzing and everything that we're doing. So even with uh, Turner Care, it's forced me to take a step back and realize that I was working hard, but I wasn't necessarily working smart. So 
Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I've already made some major changes that I'm going to do different when I go back. That's going to put me in a much better position financially, but it's also going to reduce some of those hours down from 100 hours a week to maybe six hours a week. But I won't lose in the process. So I know I got to get me a nurse practitioner. I know I have to switch my electronic medical record system because I had an EMR system that really wasn't up to date with technology. So as we talk about technology, it's much more advantageous if I have a system where patients can communicate with me through the portal system, through text. We can have video chat. Uh, they can upload different things. I can respond to their labs without me having to call them physically over the phone. Mm -hmm. So technology um, is something that we're going to realize we need now more than ever. Yeah. You know, it kind of forced churches to realize that, hey, look, the way you did it back in 1940s with, with your dad, who was a preacher, whose dad was a preacher, it's not the way we're going to do it in 2000s. Y'all talking about millennials don't, don't come. It, it's a reason. Yeah. So I think it's forced all of us business owners to take a step back and make sure that we're being ahead of the curve and not behind the curve. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's also helped us to remember priority. Mm -hmm. God, family, work, and other stuff. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we get so passionate in what we're doing and, and trying to pursue our dreams and stuff like that and not realizing that our child is acting out because their love language is quality time. And we're buying gifts and not realizing that we're not even making a connection. So as we see the rise of depression and suicide and all these different things, there has to be an origin of it. We don't know where we're going if we don't know where we've been. So when we talk about this culture of mistrust that, you know, Ebony and everyone else has talked about, I told the governor, you know, they act on the task force. You know, what do y'all think is going on in the African-American community? And our task force meetings are like one hour to two hours. I say, well, look, we don't even have the time on this call for me to appropriately give you a response. But let me say this to you. There's a large amount of distrust in the community of African-Americans that dates all the way back to the Tuskegee Institute. And we can even take it back to slavery. Right, right. Until we address that, acknowledge that, we won't be able to get through this. Health disparities didn't start with COVID-19. Right. I say this has been going on, diabetes, cancer, all the way back to HIV AIDS. But it's time for us to get serious about making sure that we're taking care of the least of these and our vulnerable communities. And it's time for us to stop talking about it and start being about it. So I'm thankful that the governor allowed us to get a task force to address the data as far as blacks. And, and we got a free warm line with the city of Jackson where anybody can call from the state of Mississippi and get the mental health and counseling. Uh, we got 90% women, not a lot of men are calling, but you know, like I talked about this culture distrust is a real thing. Yep. Going back to what I said initially, it's forcing us to kind of really evaluate who we really are individually, who we really are collectively. And I pray that going forward, while we're practicing social distancing, that we will continue to stand apart, but fight together like never before. Right, right. So thank you, uh, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Turner, just you know, just laid it out for us. And, and he was brave enough to be the only uh, male on this panel. So I appreciate you for, for saying that. And, uh, you know, you all have hit on some, some great points. And I think that, you know, especially for our community, especially people listening from Mississippi as well as abroad. I mean, I know people are, are listening in from everywhere. Uh, you know, it's important to, to understand what this really means for us and, uh, you know, and technology. And I, I too have, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like this is almost like the best thing that's happened to me in like uh, a year or two, uh, because like you said, I I'm taking time to reflect. I started that garden that, that Jasmine was talking about. Uh, you know, I haven't been traveling so much. I used to be a, a diamond medallion on, on Delta, which is like the top. And, uh, you know, I haven't been on a plane maybe you know once or twice since it, since everything hit. Uh, it's giving you time to sit, sit back and think about it. And I, I appreciate what you all are saying here. And so I know we have about five minutes left. What we're going to do is we're going to do a, a, a recap. Uh, I want you all to tell uh, briefly what your favorite uh, technology is or, or tech must have. Uh, and then any takeaways you want to leave uh, the folks with in about a minute or so. So, um, Dr. Turner, you can go ahead. Okay. My, yeah, my favorite technology is my MacBook. Um, when I switch to Apple, I feel like I found the best thing next to my wife so uh <laughs> i love my mac macbook and um I, i'm probably gonna go and get a new one sometime over the next week if anybody saw my facebook post but uh it's lasted forever 
mm-hmm. as far as takeaways, I just want everyone to know that your health is your wealth. And one thing that we have not been doing is prioritizing. So in Mississippi, we got 421 deaths. It has caught the attention of everyone, right? And this is one of the only few times in history where white America has been told what they can and cannot do. Everybody's attention is raised. So understand that you can get quality care through telehealth. You can get telemental health and still get quality care. Some patients want to reschedule. Well, I ain't paying no money and, and, and he can't even touch me on the phone. Realistically, most of the stuff that we can treat, we don't have to put a stethoscope on you. Am I saying that we should? No, I'm not saying that. But this is 2020. So utilize technology. You can have a visit on your lunch break instead of you taking off a whole day of work and now you're not being able to get paid. Um, so all that being said, yes, you can get quality care with telehealth. So be prepared because we're about to make some moves going forward to make sure that people in Jackson are getting quality care, but also the folks in Delta who also don't have access to a provider because internet and stuff is not there. So man, get excited. Like I'm so excited about what this has done. We're about to make moves with technology. It's about to be on. Love it. Love it. All right, Kim. All right. Yeah. Um, so my biggest takeaway would be to um, focus on what's important. This may mean prioritizing or not prioritizing because sometimes we can prioritize too much. But what it definitely means is you got to eliminate those things that are not in your control. You can't control everything. Um, and what I can tell you is that many of the folks that sit in front of me, they deal with anxiety. And even those that have dealt with depression um, was due to them trying to control too many things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so prioritize what's important, focus on what's important. And oftentimes that can be the folks around you, the people in your circle. Right. Um, as far as my favorite technology, the thing I hold dear, um, I would have to say music is important. So yes, I am ready for Erica Badu and Jill Scott in a few hours. Yep. Um, I have been with D Nice probably every night, um, <laughs> just because I need that day party, that night party, that quarantine. Right. Um, music <laughs> is a relief for me, and I tell folks I listen to all types of music. So coming down the highway today, um, I went from Disney playlist to my Black feminist playlist to my gospel playlist because it's just that serious. Um, so music for me, iTunes music, Amazon music, all of them, um, are important and necessary, but I would also say there are apps out there that can help with relaxation that you don't have to pay for. I always send my clients to YouTube and tell them to type in, um, mm-hmm. deep breathing or type in meditation or type in, um, relaxation. Sometimes those, just those sounds. You can also do the same thing on iTunes, um, and even on the podcast. So there are things that are there. Um, that are free that you don't have to pay for um, that can help with relaxation and deep breathing if that's something you can benefit from. I will say if you're already a person that deals with anxiety, um, be careful with deep breathing because sometimes that can send you into like panic attack symptoms. Um, So just being more cognizant of what's helpful for you. Got you. Yeah, I I definitely have my rain sounds and Alexa. Yeah. Uh, All right, uh, Dr. Hollinger. Um, so I admittedly am, am not much of a techie, but no I would say my, I'm sorry, Nashley. I mean, no Dr. Cephas, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I never have been, <laughs> but I would have to say, but besides my iPhone, I'd have to say probably Netflix. Okay. Um, I think simply because I'm not one that really watches a lot of TV just because, you know, it's just like everything else is, you know, takes precedent. So, um, but it's really allowed me to just like, even if I had to break it up in, you know, in pieces, because I don't get to just sit and spend an hour watching something. I just love that I have the ability now to kind of find all these new movies, find stuff that, you know, I can watch with my family, find stuff that me and my husband like, because we didn't have, because with him, you know, being a band director with school, it was just like, chaotic because you know he was always at Jackson State but now that you know he's doing work from home then we can you know watch things that we enjoy things that we weren't able to do before so I would say Netflix Mm -hmm. um and I guess my takeaway um would be you know I know um Dr. Turner talked a lot about um you know just kind of like the impact from uh, health perspective of African Americans and why there's, you know, we have such a huge disparities in the cases of, of COVID-19 and I, in just my own personal journey into 
uh, health and wellness and really taking my own health as a priority. And like with Dr. Turner's, you have to prioritize. You really have to prioritize yourself because if you don't prioritize yourself, nobody else is going to do that. Um, and so I think, you know, for us uh, as black people, especially as black women, you know, we really have to put ourselves first. Um, and that includes like what we're eating, how we're eating, you know, exercising and, and not, you know, looking at those things as um, burdens and ways to, you know, oh, that costs money and that costs money. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we do spend money on what we want. And so if somebody can go buy a pack of cigarettes, they can go buy, you know, an apple or, you know, things like that. So we have to keep that in mind and not just put in our mind a bunch of excuses of why we can't do certain things. And I think technology, with it being a little more abundant than what it used to be, I think it's going to open up an avenue for people who weren't able to um be able to be a part of certain things like exercise and fitness because there's a whole host of free resources out there now um, for people to be able to be active, you know, learn about how to eat and things like that. So I think that's really, really, really important is that we just really have to make ourselves a priority if we want to live um, long, healthy lives. Right. Absolutely. And I know we, we're two minutes over, but uh, Ebony, I want to make sure you uh, get your takeaways and your favorite take. And I'm going to tag on. We did get one question come in the last minute here. Uh, we're going to try to get it answered. I'm going to put this on you, Ebony. Okay. Uh, how can we help kids cope with COVID-19? Um, one thing that I think um, we should do to try to help kids cope with COVID-19 is to be open and honest with them. Let them know what is going on and why they're not able to go to school. Let them know reasons why they can't go and play um, with Johnny next door. Um, because a lot of people don't understand kids are a lot smarter than what we give them credit to. They hear things and they see things. So talk to them about it. Um, let them know the importance of wearing masks and washing your hands. We supposed to have been washing hands all along, but right. now we're having to, um, increase hand washing, um, and making sure that we, we, we groom ourselves like we're supposed to do. So be open and honest with your children to let them know what is going on in the world and how the pandemic is affecting not only them, but the rest of the world. So I would definitely say be open and honest with them. Um, and after you are open and honest with them, be able to allow them to ask you questions. Ask, let, let them ask you questions and you give your best answer to them. And after, let them go outside and play in the mud, get some, get some vitamin D. I tell people all the time, vitamin D is, is, is vital to, healthy brain function. We don't understand the importance of vitamin D. And I know the doctors that's on the panel can speak um, and provide us a wealth of information on the imp importance of vitamin D. A lot of individuals have stated that they feel as if though they're a prisoner in their own home because they cannot go out. They cannot socialize with other individuals. They cannot touch. Um, but what I have told people is if you have a front porch, you can still go outside and breathe in some fresh air. They right. did not tell us that we could not travel outside of our parameters. What I mean by that, put your children in the car, let them know we're going for a drive across the reservoir. It's important for us to be able to see that life is still going on outside the parameters of our home. Right. Love it. Love it. And, and real quick, favorite technology and oh. um, Take my, away. um, my, my cell phone would be my, my favorite technology. Yep. I I have it. <laughs> All right. Any other quick takeaways for us? Ms. Ebony? Um, unplug from the computer and, and the news periodically. I do believe that overstimulation is, is not as good as it is, uh, we think it should be. So be able to unplug, um, unplug from social media. Um, even if it's just a few hours, you know, a few hours a day, because we can go from happy to sad just based on what we're reading and um, reading on social media and seeing on the on the TV screen. So unplug for a few minutes a day to take a little space. You got some snaps on that one. All right. I love this. All right. So uh, I'll just give some real quick closing remarks. We, we've had an awesome panel today. This is the first time we've done this uh, at the Bean Path because we're going virtual now. And, and I love, I absolutely love it. Um, I hope that you all will, um, you know, definitely rewatch, share this with other folks. We'll be posting this on our uh, website as well as our social media. And uh, I want to also mention that we have a new scholarship that we are launching 
and we want you all to, to share with us high school students. Uh, we'll be giving away uh, tech uh, scholarships for laptops for college students, uh, entering college students. So definitely check that out. Um, and I think, yeah, I just, I'm just excited that, that we had this panel today. Um, like they said, technology can be a blessing and a curse. So you just gotta <laughs> know how to use it the right way. And uh, all right, well, thanks everybody so much and you all have a, a good rest of your day. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Right, everything was great. Thank awesome you. job. Thank you. Love it. Y'all have a great one. Have a good one.